so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm so glad to talk with all of you today virtually from my family room. Uh, and I want to start with a story about my oldest child who had been in public school from kindergarten through eighth grade. In ninth grade, he moved to a prep school that he was woefully underprepared for. And he was really struggling in all of his academic disciplines, but he was struggling especially in Spanish. And he was struggling enough in Spanish that um, at the end of his first trimester, he had a 58 as his grade. Uh, so his uh, guidance counselor called me and my husband and my son into um, her office and said, you know, yeah, 58 is an F. <laughs> you know, we've got to move him into something else or they're going to toss him from the school. Uh, he's now on academic probation. And my husband and I were like, yes, yes, you know, let's come up with a new class. And the, the guidance counselor said, how about drumming? And I said, that sounds good. And my son said, no, 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 you know, I love Spanish. I really, I really need to stick with it. And, you know, my, my husband and I were like, no, you know, they're, they're going to toss you from the school. And Andrew said, no, no, but I just, I love the Spanish class. And, you know, it's, it's just great. And I said, yes, but, you know, you suck at it and they're, they're going to toss you. Uh, but, but he really begged and pleaded. So we worked out a deal with the guidance counselor and the Spanish teacher that he would get a tutor, he would meet with a Spanish teacher once a week, um, and he would show, you know, renewed study habits and diligence, and we'd give him a one-month trial period. So we give him this one-month trial period, and at the end of the month, he's actually pulled his grade up a little bit. So the Spanish teacher said, okay, you know, we'll give it a go. We'll, we'll let him try. And he stayed in Spanish for the year, and at the end of his first year, his Spanish teacher called me and said, I've just finished computing my final grades. Andrew has an A minus for the end of the year. And I said, is there a prize associated with that? Um, which it turns out there's not. Um, but I use that story to illustrate a really important uh, point. So today my talk is technically called the science of success. But what I'll be talking about is how much the science of success is not really about succeeding. It's really about how do we respond when things don't go well? How do we respond to failure? Um, and Andrew is really a perfect example of how he took something that was literally a failure, an F, and he in fact turned it into a success. And I'll be talking today in particular about what research tells us in terms of the power of who is able to make this shift, who is able to really show remarkable success. And what the research shows is that people who are the best at doing this are high at something that psychologists call emotional intelligence. So what is emotional intelligence? And I'm sure many of you have heard of this concept before, but what we describe it in psychology is technically an awareness that emotions can drive our behavior and can influence us both positively and negatively. But that awareness is also coupled with an ability to manage our emotions. And that includes managing our own emotions, how do we feel, but it also includes managing the emotions of other people around us. And this ability to do this self-regulation is especially important under times of great pressure. That's when you really see it having an effect. So we know there are lots of benefits to having a high EQ. People who have high EQ experience better health, physical and psychological health. They experience better relationship satisfaction. This includes relationships with their friends, with their family members. Um, it also includes better happiness. And for people who are really interested in this topic, um, at the end, I'll give you my website. And I actually have a different talk that examines specifically the science of happiness and how that's strongly linked with EQ. But what I'm basically going to be focusing on for today is how the science of success in our careers is very heavily influenced by emotional intelligence. That people who are high in emotional intelligence have better career success. Um, they're more successful at starting and running businesses. They're more often identified as leaders. And basically that's when it really seems to shine. There was a remarkable study that was done a number of years ago at Harvard University, and it was done with men who had attended and received MBAs from the business school. So this was obviously a group of really elite leaders, um, but what they did was examine the success of men within this very elite sample, and they compared the relative impact of emotional intelligence versus other kinds of traits and abilities. And here's what they found. 
To be sure, intellect was a driver of outstanding performance. Cognitive skills such as big picture thinking and long-term vision were particularly important. But when I calculated the ratio of technical skills, IQ, and emotional intelligence as ingredients of excellent performance, emotional intelligence proved to be twice as important as the others for jobs at all levels. If your emotional abilities aren't in hand, if you don't have self-awareness, if you're not able to manage your distressing emotions, if you can't have empathy and have effective relationships, then no matter how smart you are, you're not going to get very far. And that's really the key finding from this research, that intellectual ability has a role and it is important, but it's not sufficient. And I now want to ask a question. This is a legitimate question. Um, who here knows, and you can just put your answer in the, um, the chat or in the Q&A, who here knows someone, could be in your personal life, could be in your professional life, who should be very, very smart based on their training, their education, and so forth, but seems to lack some sort of basic fundamental common sense and emotional intelligence and sort of ability to get along. Um, if you know someone like that, just say yes. Don't type that person's name into the chat room. That would just be rude. Um, but who here knows someone who has that? Because all of us can really think about people in our own lives who were like, um, yeah, that person really should be better at these things, and they're not. Um, and, and I'm seeing just yes, yes, yes. Many people are responding. Um, I also should have said at the beginning, um, this is being recorded. Everybody will get a copy of this. I'm also glad to share my slide deck, and I'll give you an option to get that at the end as well. Some people have said absolutely. Um, sometimes um, when I'm doing this talk, of course, live, um, people will like point to people around them, and I'm like, no, 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 don't point. Don't point, um, just identify. And so here's the key, that we know that EQ matters, that we can experience it in our own lives. Um, but I now want to turn and talk about what exactly is EQ, because when we talk about EQ, there are actually different components of it. It's not just one dimension. It's actually multifaceted. Um, so one dimension is self-awareness. And this is a really important part of it, that people who are self-aware are higher in EQ. And this means that they are self-confident, so they feel good about themselves, that's important. Um, but it also means that they are realistic in terms of their strengths and weaknesses. And this is a really important finding um, because having a realistic sense of your strengths and weaknesses does two things for you. One, it lets you work on the things that you're not so good at. And I'm actually gonna talk about that at the end today. How can we focus on our weaknesses and try to build our skills in that domain? But the other thing it does that's really important is it helps us put together teams, um, groups, um, it helps us hire, and so on, because we're aware of where we're not strong. I have a wonderful co-author. Um, I live in Massachusetts. My co-author for a book uh, lives in California. And we are a perfect pair because basically everything that I hate to do in terms of the writing process, she's like super good at and she loves to do. Um, and everything that she hates, I'm really good at. And so we're this wonderful team because we basically just divide up the work and each of us is doing what we love and what we're better at and we're not having to do the other stuff but we can only do that because we're both aware of like yeah this is like not my thing um and and that's been really helpful uh and this is actually seems pretty obvious that well having this sense of your weaknesses and strengths would be important but many people who are not high in EQ actually don't um, and this cartoon i think illustrates the challenge i want greater self-awareness but can I continue to be unaware of my bad qualities? Um, because the reality is, is that we like to focus on what we're strong at. We'd like to focus on what we're good at um, that feels good and affirming and powerful. We don't really like to focus on what we're not good at, but people who are high in EQ, they also focus on what they're not good at. Um, and then finally, they have a self-deprecating sense of humor. Um, because the reality is most of us in our daily lives and our jobs, we're not doing you know, curing cancer, or it's not life or death. Um, and so people who are high in EQ, when things go poorly, um, when they experience a you know, rejection from a client or they have a demotion in their job or they're in a pandemic and things are not going so well, they have a sense of, okay, I'm gonna ride this out, I'm not gonna take it too seriously, and they're able to sort of buffer negative experiences. So one important component is self-awareness. Second important component is something called self-regulation or grit. And we hear about this a lot in society, this idea of being really gritty. Um, but the research on this actually started decades ago with a very famous study 
that was done at Stanford University called the Marshmallow Study. And I now just want to see where people are. So um, tell me if you know what the Marshmallow Study is. Can you just type in yes or no in the chat room? Because I'm going to talk about what it is, but I'd just like to know where people are initially. And this is one of those things that's gotten a little bit of attention in the popular press. So some people are aware of that. And I'm seeing a few yeses, but a lot of noes. Um, so you're going to love it now because it's going to be so cool and you're going to remember it and share it with your friends and family later today. So this was a super clever study um, that was done a number of years ago. It started in the 1970s. They brought in little kids, like three or four year old kids, and they sat them in front of a marshmallow. And they said, you can eat this marshmallow right now, but if you can wait 10 or 15 minutes, I'm gonna bring you in a plate of marshmallows. Um, so it's your choice. So the researcher walks out of the room. It's a psychology study. So they've like watched the people through a one way mirror and they're just timing to see what the kids do. And what's fascinating is that some kids immediately take the marshmallow, they eat it, and you know the study's over. It's like 10 seconds long, it's done. Other kids do something remarkable. They wait. And if you watch a video of this, it's, it's really fascinating because they're doing all sorts of things to not look at the marshmallow. They're looking at the ceiling, they're looking at their fingers, they're looking at their feet. Some of them are turning away and like covering the marshmallow. They're doing all of these things um, in order to not be tempted by it. And then the researcher comes back in and gives them, you know, this uh, several marshmallows. So what's interesting first is that even kids that are three or four show this tremendous uh, range in terms of who eats it and who doesn't. But what's even more interesting is they have now followed up these kids who were three or four in 1970, and they followed them up every five years since. And what they have shown, I'll give you that in just a second. What they've shown is that kids who delay eating the marshmallow when they are three have all sorts of benefits later on. They're more likely to graduate from high school. They have higher SAT scores. They're more likely to graduate from college. Um, they experience all sorts of benefits. They're less likely to have you know, intense credit card debt or go bankrupt or all these different things. And so not eating the marshmallow when you're three or four seems to be a personality trait that's basically about delay of gratification. And if you're good at delaying gratification, you can delay gratification not just for the marshmallow, but for lots of other things in your life. And as the researcher, Angela Duckworth at Penn, who created this concept of grit, describes, grit is sticking with your future day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. So the key aspect of grit basically is taking a long-term perspective, saying, I'm not going to do just what feels good in the moment, but I'm really going to think about um, my future and the benefits, and I'm going to delay what feels good right at this exact second, and I'm going to focus on the potential future benefits. And for people who are interested in this topic, um, there's a wonderful book that was written by Walter Michelle, the researcher who established this concept, called The Marshmallow Test. And it actually examines this power of self-control and how it's very predictive um, of future success in lots of different ways. Uh, in what is a weird uh, personal quirk, my husband is one of the marshmallow kids. Uh, and people are always like, hey, wait, what did he do? What did he do? Um, and of course, you know, he doesn't remember what we did last weekend. There's no chance that he remembers if he ate a marshmallow when he was three. Uh, but pre-pandemic, he used to spend a lot of time watching ESPN. So um, that would kind of bode poorly in terms of what research would say. All right. So one is self-awareness. Two is self-regulation. Uh, three is internal, not external motivation. And this is a really interesting one because what it's really saying is that we perform better and people who are high in EQ know this when we are internally motivated to achieve something um, as opposed to when we're doing something for the external rewards, you know, fame or money um, or these, you know, big sort of glamorous things. And, and yet the challenge is in our society, we often externally reward things that should be intrinsically motivating. And, and the presence of those external rewards can actually undermine intrinsic motivation. I want to give you a really simple example. Um, they've done studies with Division I college athletes who are on different kinds of scholarships. Athletic scholarships, where your ability to stay in school for free is contingent on playing that sport, or other kinds of scholarships, financial need, merit, you know, achievement, and so on. And they've looked at what is your love of the game? And what they find is that athletes who are on athletic scholarships, where they have to continue playing that sport in order to stay in school for free, they report less enjoyment of their sport because again, they don't think I'm doing this because I love playing the sport. They're doing it because they have to keep doing it in order to uh, continue to go to school for free. So the challenge is that when we 
put up these external rewards, it actually can undermine our intrinsic interest. And when we have higher levels of intrinsic interest, we actually show better performance. Um, as Stephen Covey says, motivation is a fire from within. If someone else tries to light that fire under you, chances are it will burn very briefly. Uh, and, and this is one of the most important findings that I think from the field of emotional intelligence and psychology um, is the importance of helping people find their internal motivation. I'm a parent, I have three kids, and one of the things that just strikes me again and again is that overwhelmingly our schools use lots of external rewards to try to motivate behavior that really should be intrinsically motivating. So one of my favorite examples, favorite slash least favorite examples is reading. Reading, of course, should be enjoyable, should be fun, should be rewarding. And yet what schools do overwhelmingly is they say, if you read this many books, you know, in a semester or in the summer or whatever, in the month of October, you will get a reward. Um, who here who's a parent, or maybe you remember from your own experience, has had a kid come home and say, if I read this many books in this period of time, I'll get some reward. And if, if that's happened to you or your kids, write what the reward is in the chat room. Because overwhelmingly what people say is, yeah, it was like candy or like pizza or like ice cream. It's often food, class party. Somebody wrote free food. It's often free food. Sometimes it's stickers. I don't know if that's had, yeah, more computer time. Um, T-shirt, oh my word, um, $10 from a local bank. That's amazing. So um, again, Many of you have experienced that, where, where they're taking something that really should be fun, and the problem is when that external reward goes away, when you're no longer going to get the, the candy or the t-shirt or the money or whatever, then kids are like, well, why would I read for free? I mean, I, I used to get the sticker or the candy or whatever, and that's really the challenge um, with internal versus external motivation. Four, empathy. People who are high in emotional intelligence are very good at putting themselves in somebody else's shoes. Um, and they can see the world from somebody else's perspective. And that actually is a really important finding because what it means is that people who are high in emotional intelligence can imagine things from somebody else's perspective. And that means they are more effective at regulating that person's emotions and really looking out and making sure they are being taken care of. And this is important, of course, in working with clients and working with colleagues and so on. Um, as Barbara Kingsolver says, empathy is really the opposite of spiritual meanness. It's the capacity to understand that every war is both won and lost, and that someone else's pain is as meaningful as your own. And what the research shows is that people vary tremendously on their ability uh, to show empathy. In one classic study, they brought in people and they said, you're going to be participating in a study on uh, doing difficult things, so difficult experiences, and you're going to be working with a partner, and the way the study works is that one person is going to experience these difficult things, and the other person is going to record their reaction. So there's an experiencer and a recorder, and we're going to draw straws to figure out which person is going to be which. And then they describe some of the tasks, and the tasks were like horrible. So one of them was literally, you're going to let a tarantula crawl up your arm. One of them was you are going to put your hand in a bucket of snakes. Um, one of them is you were going to hold a rat. I mean, they were, they were awful things. Uh, and so you're told you're going to be either the experiencer or the recorder, and we're going to draw straws. So the researcher then draws straws, and they've, they've rigged it. It's a psychology study. And so they draw the piece of paper out, and you learn that you are the recorder. So you are now thinking, Yes, I'm the recorder. I was hoping for that job. And then it gets hard because then the researcher goes to you and says, hey, um, I know that you got recorder, um, but your partner is really freaking out because they are terrified of spiders and they're just freaking out. And so I'm wondering, would you be willing to switch places and you could be the experiencer and your partner would be the recorder? Would you be willing to, to make that switch? Mm -hmm. Now, here's what's interesting. Uh, this partner is not your friend, it's not your girlfriend, it's not your sister, it's not your roommate, you've never seen this person before, you're never going to see them again. Uh, so some people, when they're asked, would you switch, they're like, uh, no, um, you know, I'm really pretty good at recording, so I think I'm going to stick with that. But other people say, okay, yeah, I'll switch, all right. Um, and they do so even when there's no gain for them at all. Um, they're just doing it because they feel this great empathy for the other person. And those tend to be people who are high in emotional intelligence. Now, in what is good news for all of you, 
is that as soon as people say, yes, I'll, I'll switch or no, I won't switch, the study ends. So there are no, there are no actual um, spiders, snakes, you know, rats, et cetera. They're just doing that to see what people would say. Uh, here's the challenge. Studies show that society is becoming more narcissistic. Interesting, but how does that affect me? Uh, who here has heard about the increase in narcissism in society? If you've heard about that, just type yes into the chat room. Because um, overwhelmingly, they've done these studies um, with uh, college seniors every year for like 30, 40 years. And every time they do one of these studies, um, rates of narcissism are higher. And it seems like a lot of you have actually heard that. So that's tended to be the case. Somebody has said, yes, I don't believe it. And I, I would love to talk more about that. So let's return to that at the end. Um, studies tend to show that people are becoming more narcissistic. Um, that may be linked with social media and the sort of selfie generation and so on. Um, and, and so one of the challenges is that higher levels of narcissism, of course, are like the opposite of empathy. And so this is one that I really worry about right now um, in terms of are we as a society becoming less focused on empathy? All right. Last but really important component of emotional intelligence, social skills. People who are high in emotional intelligence are very, very good at making other people feel included, making other people feel involved, um, and that tends to lead people to perform better. Many people have experienced a situation in which they are in a group and they have been ostracized, they've not been heard, people have not paid attention to them, or so on. And that often leads people to withdraw effort, even in cases in which helping the group, in which contributing to the group, uh, would improve their own outcomes. In a really clever study that was designed to look at this issue of how much do we in fact withdraw effort when we feel that we're not heard or not included, researchers brought in people and told them that they were going to be participating in a group decision-making task and they were going to be competing with other groups you know for money and prizes so you're going to be competing with other groups um, and you actually can win something so you walk into a room there's two other people sitting in the group uh, and you are are told that you're going to be working with these group members these are strangers to you then the researcher says hey i'm really sorry you know, I'm, I was backed up in the copy machine, so I haven't finished making the copies of questionnaires that I need to give you. So it's really important that you sit here for the next 10 minutes and you don't talk at all. Uh, because in fact, um, this study, part of it is getting to know each other as group members. Uh, and, and so you can't do that before the study's actually started. So please sit here for 10 minutes and don't say anything. So the three people are sitting in a room and not talking. But what you don't know, the person coming in for the study, is that the other two people are actually in cahoots with the researcher. They are accomplices of the, of the researcher. And so one of these people who's an accomplice picks up a piece of paper, wads it up, and starts throwing it around. So for two minutes, all three group members throw the piece of paper back and forth and back and forth. They're just having fun. Then, here's the key. After two minutes, the two people who are in cahoots with the researcher throw the piece of paper back and forth to each other for eight minutes and they don't look at the other person at all. Um, so for eight minutes, you experience this like massive sense of ostracizing um, and the other two people don't look at you, et cetera. And if you watch a video of this, um, the person who's all of a sudden been ostracized is like trying to figure out what's going on. They're trying to like jump back in. They're trying to like make eye contact because again, from their perspective, it was like, hey, we're all like um, playing, we're all like interacting. Um, and all of a sudden uh, I got ostracized. So. The researcher then comes back in and goes, okay, here are these different kinds of things, here are these different um, items, and you're gonna do a group brainstorming task to figure out how many different uses you can make with these different items. It's a standard test of creativity. And what they find is the person who's been ostracized doesn't contribute at all. That person withdraws effort. They're like, I don't care if I'm not gonna win, I don't care if I'm not gonna get more money, um, I don't care you know, about the prizes, I'm not gonna help out these other people. And that's the challenge, that if people are in a group in which they are not feeling included, their voice is not heard, they tend to withdraw effort. And people who are high in emotional intelligence are very good at making people feel heard, make, making people feel included, and that's a fundamental part um, of having emotional intelligence. Um, I, I'm gonna, answer this question very briefly about can someone have too much EQ? Somebody can't have too much EQ in and of itself as a concept, but people can definitely have too much of the different components. And I'll talk more about that at the end. That's a really important question. So overall, no, you can't have too much EQ, but you can be too high in empathy, you know, for example. And I'm glad to talk about that more at the end. And I will definitely leave time for questions because I love hearing what people think. Um, but I now want to turn 
to giving you all a chance to test your own IQ, uh, EQ, sorry. And if anybody wants the whole scale, in the interest of time today, I'm just giving you a brief snippet, but um, there, it's actually a 42 item scale. And if anybody sends me an email at the end, I can send you out a, um, a test that you can use on your own if you're interested. But I'm giving you a couple of sample items from each of the different components of the EQ scale, because I really wanna illustrate that it's EQ is not one component. There's actually different components. And so each of us can be higher or lower on different aspects. So some of the major events of my life have led me to reevaluate what is important and not important. Um, and that's a sense that people with EQ with high EQ have often kind of been through some stuff. Um, so that has helped them have a better sense of perspective taking. I can tell how other people are feeling just by looking at them. They're very good at picking up nonverbal signs of facial expression, you know, body posture, um, and so on. They tend to seek out activities that make them feel happy. So they're good at trying to find ways of increasing happiness in their own lives. And that makes them more effective at managing other people because they actually prioritize happiness. Uh, four, they have high self-awareness uh, of their own emotions. So it can be easy to kind of confuse, am I feeling anxious or tired or hungry or mad? And they're good at being able to identify what is the specific emotion. Uh, five, they're aware of the nonverbal messages I send to others. Um, and, and so two was, can you pick up on what other people are thinking or feeling? Five is, are you aware of what you're giving off? I gave um, this talk a few years ago in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a woman came up at the end, I remember it vividly, and she goes, I have the perfect example of number five. I've been told that I have resting bitch face, um, and probably a lot of you know what that is, but if you don't, Google it. Um, but it's actually a perfect illustration of nonverbal, and she said, you know, for years, I've been giving off this, you know, sort of negative expression, and, and then my sister told me, and my boss told me, and now I, I try to overcome it. So it's actually a really good example of number five. Um, and then finally, I compliment others when they have done something well. People who are high in EQ are very good at sharing credit. They, they praise people, they compliment people, and that, of course, makes people want to work with them and collaborate more. Um, now I want to turn, and this is really the second part of my talk, which is, what's the good news? And the good news is, emotional intelligence can change, because really, if it couldn't, it'd be kind of a waste for you to listen to this, because basically, I'd be like, yeah, some of you are high, some of you are not, oh well. Uh, so how do we change it? Having an awareness of your EQ, EQ strengths and weaknesses. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of go through the different components, the different um, uh, uh, aspects in terms of that scale, because it's really important for you to understand that all of us have higher parts and lower parts within our EQ. So understanding where you're strong, understanding where you're weak can help you be able to develop the parts of EQ that maybe are not your natural strengths. But the other important aspect of EQ is also having an understanding of your mindset. How do you think about yourself? How do you think about the world? And I wanna now turn to talk about this role of mindset. So what is mindset? And in psychology, we talk about mindset in terms of the view that we adopt about ourselves and also the world. Many people have what we call a fixed mindset. And in a fixed mindset, people believe that their basic qualities, how smart they are, how extroverted they are, how musical they are, whatever, are fixed, they're innate, they're never going to change. But what I want to do is to push you to instead adopt what we call a growth mindset. In a growth mindset, people believe that their basic qualities, how athletic they are, how empathetic they are, and so on, can be developed through effort and hard work. And what's so important to understand is that mindset influences us in fundamental ways. Um, Many of us have probably heard the stereotype, older people are feeble and absent-minded. And once you have that stereotype, it influences you in all sorts of ways. Um, I'll give a personal example, which is that a few years ago, I was giving a talk in New Jersey. I had had a busy day. Um, I you know, taught classes, I had meetings, I went home and packed, I did it with my family and finally got in the car to drive to New Jersey at uh, 9 p.m. at night. I live in Massachusetts, it's about a four hour drive. Um, and so because I was leaving so late, I wore sweatpants and a ratty t-shirt um, and running shoes. So I get in the car, I'm driving, and um, my talk is in New Jersey at Friday morning at 9 a.m. And at 11 o'clock, my husband calls me and he goes, your suitcase is on the bed. And I was like, oh my word. Um, because of course, you know, I'm not dressed to give a talk. And I said, can you please Google and figure out, you know, what's open in New Jersey, um, in Princeton, that's where the talk was before 9 a.m. 
So he calls and he finds out and the answer is Walmart. So I drive to Walmart. Um, I check into the hotel at 1 a.m. I drive to Walmart at 7 a.m. I buy an outfit um, from the Miley Cyrus collection, uh, which I wear to give the talk. And at lunch, I confess to you know other people how horrible my day had been. And of course, people were like, absent-minded professor, ha, 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 whatever. Um, but that happened when I was about 45 years old. If I had been 60 or 70, people would have been like, oh, you know, she's losing her mind, you know, dementia, senior moment. Uh, and the reality is once you start thinking, oh, senior moment, people act accordingly. In a really clever study done at NYU in a big high-rise building in Manhattan, they brought in college students, had them complete a test on a computer, and half of them during the test were flashed words that um, subliminally prime aging, like um, wrinkles, shuffleboard, early bird dinner, you know, arthritis, and so on. And at the end of the study, they, they said to students, okay, you know, you're done, thank you so much for coming in. But at the end of the study, what they were doing was actually timing how long it took people to walk from the exit of the experimental room to the elevator at the end of the hall. And what they found was that students who'd been primed at a subliminal level, below the level of consciousness, with words cueing old age, actually walked slower to the elevator. And that's an example about how these subtle primes of aging and the negative stereotypes can actually change our behavior, how we interpret people's behavior, but also our own behavior. Um, many people have heard the stereotype, some people are naturally good at math, some people are not. And the challenge is, as soon as you believe some people are not naturally good at math, and you're one of them, uh, you stop doing math. And then you get really bad at math. Um, we've all heard about the power of placebos. Somebody has a headache, you give them a you know, sugar pill and tell them it's a headache reliever, and they in fact um, show headache reduction. But a remarkable study that was done at a Veterans Administration Hospital in Houston found that telling people that they were having surgery actually led to significant decreases in pain and weakness. This is a group of men, um, who had, veterans who'd been complaining of um, knee pain, randomly assigned. One group had actual orthoscopic knee surgery. One of them, they had uh, surgery, but the surgeon just scraped away the cartilage. Third condition, they literally put them under, cut the knee open, sewed the knee back up. And then they examined them for 18 months and they examined pain, flexibility, you know, can you go upstairs well, et cetera. What they found, all three groups improved at an equal rate. And that study really illustrates the power of the placebo. Believing you're gonna feel better led to actual changes, led you to feel better. Um, but perhaps what's most important is there's this key belief in our society that stress is terrible, but we can shift our stress mindset. So we often think the effects of stress are negative and should be avoided. We can instead think experiencing stress facilitates my learning and growth. We can think experiencing stress depletes my health and vitality, but we can shift that mindset and we can think instead, experiencing stress enhances my performance and productivity. Those are all ways in which we can take the negative mindsets about stress and we can flip it and think about it as I feel more energized, more alert, more active under times of stress. And this is something that we can all use in our daily lives, personally, professionally, very timely these days. And I want to encourage you to figure out ways in which you can take events in your own life and try to shift them. Um, I'll talk about a couple of just brief examples from my own life. Um, shortly after graduating from college, I was dating this guy and um, we were living in Atlanta and uh, we were going out for a hike, you know, one lovely fall weekend and we got a flat tire. I sat in the car and sort of freaked out, you know, oh my God, our day is ruined, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's going to be so expensive. We're going to have to get the car towed. And my boyfriend was like, I'm just going to change the flat tire. And he did. And it was like 10 minutes and we were on our way. So I was freaking out and he was like, this is no big deal. Um, my son, the Spanish scholar, um, when he was in, I don't know, uh, second or third grade, he had this lovely teacher, he was like 22 years old. And I came in for parent teacher conference and she said, I'm really worried. I think Andrew has obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and I said, why? Because, uh, his room at the time looked like a you know, bomb had hit it. He never flushed the toilet. I pretty much was like, don't get my hopes up. Um, and she said, well, all day, he just walks back and forth the classroom to sharpen his pencil. Um, and overwhelmingly, uh, I think he just can only focus if he has a very uh, sharp uh, point on his pencil. So I go home and I'm like, Andrew, what the hell are you doing with the pencil sharpener? 
And he's basically like, I'm bored. If you break your pencil, you get to walk. So she had diagnosed him as having OCD and he was just doing something to make the very stressful classroom experience more manageable. Different perspectives. Um, finally, my um, middle child, Robert, is a real introvert. When he was heading to school on the day of his um, standardized test day that we've all heard about is so stressful, I sat down and said, hey, you know, I know it's going to be really stressful today. It's a really hard day. Um, just try to take some deep breaths and stay calm. And he said, I love standardized test day. You never have to read aloud or work with a partner. It's my favorite day all year. Um, and I use these examples to illustrate the power of perception. And research has shown that simply learning about this matters. Researchers in one study brought in people um, who work for a large international finance institution. Half of them saw a video that said, stress is enhancing, stress will help you. Exactly what I've said today. The other half had a video which is stress is debilitating. And they found that people who'd seen the stress is enhancing video had fewer symptoms of anxiety and depression, better work performance. So again, powerful example, shifting our stress mindset leads to better work performance, better psychological well-being. As Jack Welch said, your career isn't always linear, but what matters is how well you get back on the horse. Um, and that's something important for us all to remember, especially during these really, really challenging times for many of us. And if this ability doesn't come naturally to you, find people in your life who can help you. Um, as I sat in by the side of the road that day with the car with the flat tire, I said, I really should marry that guy. Um, and that is my husband. Um, so I now want to turn in our last few minutes, and I just want to give you some strategies that you can use um, to try to shift your emotional intelligence. And again, I'm glad to send out this deck, you know, anyone who wants it. Um, I know that um, Kathy is going to provide an audio recording, you know, to anybody who wants to listen to it as well, if you want to reflect back. Um, focus on effort, not ability. We often focus so much in our society about what we're good at, what we're not good at. Focus on effort, it's really essential. As Winston Churchill said, continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, is the key to unlocking our potential. Uh, two, put away the phone. Um, it's very hard to focus on emotionally intelligent behavior, picking up on your nonverbal cues, other people's nonverbal cues, if we're simply um, relying on um, uh, you know, what is written. So try to just to focus on people who are in your lives. If you're on the phone, try to do it through, you know, FaceTime, um, through Zoom, so that we're really getting a sense of what people are thinking or feeling. We can all think about times um, in which we've had a miscommunication uh, because of not interpreting sarcasm or tone of voice or something. So trying to look at people in the eye, again, post-pandemic times, um, is really important. And, and doing what we can to really pay attention to people around us helps us be able to pick up, really importantly, on nonverbal messages. Uh, three, ignore the crowd, go with your gut. Um, and this is a really important one that, that's kind of near and dear to my own heart these days. Um, and that's particularly important um, because we can often get swayed by loud, salient voices and we can ignore bad behavior in times in which we really shouldn't. Um, research has shown that exposure to big uh, social media images uh, increases the rate of eating disorders in women. Um, and that's again, because we see these extraordinarily thin images of women in society. My work with college students has shown that um, college women who pay more attention to social media are more likely to have disordered eating. Um, and in fact, have obscenely um, unrealistic ideals, and that can have really dangerous consequences. But we see this in all sorts of cases. Um, many people were swayed by what appeared to be this miracle um, blood test developed by Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. And of course, that turned out to be a fraud. Many people for years overlooked Harvey Weinstein's bad behavior, um, and that let that bad behavior continue. Um, I have a new book out if people are interested in this topic called Why We Act, that actually examines why people overlooked bad behavior at a corporate level um, that explains corporate fraud, fraternity hazing, um, ignoring sexual misconduct, and so on. In so many cases, people sort of innerly felt like something bad is happening, but they failed to speak up. As Quentin Tarantino said, I knew enough to do more than I did. And that let Harvey Weinstein's behavior continue for years. Uh, four, be a team player. Virtually all of us work on teams. We report to people, people report to us, we have clients and so on. Um, no matter how good or smart you are, if you can't get along with other people, team cannot be successful. As Babe Ruth said, the way a team plays as a whole 
determines its success. You may have the greatest bunch of individual stars in the world. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, but if they don't play together, the club won't be worth a dime. Pay attention to nonverbal communication, yours and others. Um, and that's so very important. Um, this includes eye contact, voice fluctuation, facial expressions, hand gestures. Uh, there's research looking at fMRI data that actually looks at pattern of brain activation. When we look at somebody shaking hands, when we look at somebody nodding um, or eye contact, suggesting that an evolutionary level, paying attention to nonverbal messages is extraordinarily important. Find your match professionally and personally. Figure out what you're good at. Um, that could be writing, it could be tutoring, it could be in your community, in your volunteer work, in your job. But as Steve Jobs said, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. Um, and it's also really important to find your match at a personal level. Um, this is a time, I think, in which people are sort of told, well, I should do this or I should do that. Um, but the reality is different things make different people happy. Um, some people find it thrilling and exciting to bungee jump or parachute jump or so on. Other people prefer reading, um, watching TV, uh, cooking, whatever. Finding your match at a personal level makes people happier. And people who are high in EQ are really good at figuring out that match, not looking to other people to figure out what should make them happy, but really finding uh, their own happiness, um, not paying attention again to what you should do. Uh, take a chance. Choose action over inaction. And this is one of my favorites because lots of people go through life being afraid of taking a chance because if you take a chance, you might experience rejection. Uh, but when you ask people, what are the biggest regrets of your life? What do you really regret? What people report time and time again is regretting things they didn't do. As Mark Twain said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. And one of the reasons why people who are high in emotional intelligence are able to take a chance to choose action over inaction is they understand that if they fail, they can admit it, they can own it, and they can move past it. Um, there's a wonderful illustration of this um, that occurred a number of years ago, um, heading up to the 92 Olympics, a famous Olympian, American Olympian, um, was training for the pole vault, and he was overwhelmingly favored to win the pole vault. I mean, I'm sorry, the decathlon pole vault was one of the elements. Um, he failed to make the Olympic trials at all. He failed to complete the pole vault in his um, in the attempt in the Olympic trials with the United States to head into the 92 Olympic Games in Barcelona. He trained for four years. He ultimately came back in 96. He went through the uh, Olympic trials. He succeeded. He went on and won the gold in the 96 game in Atlanta. And a reporter asked him, how did you manage to come back from what was like the most colossal shake choke ever in Olympic trials when the world record holder in the decathlon couldn't even, got disqualified because he couldn't actually manage the pole vault this one day in Olympic trials. And he talked about every day for the last four years, he woke up in the morning, he got out of bed, he put in his VHS tape, put it in his VCR, and he watched himself choke the games. And he wallowed in it and he owned it. And that ability to own it and get used to it and acclimate to it over time, let him move on and start training again, and ultimately let him win the gold medal in the 96 games four years later. Um, and I use that as an example because most of us are never going to experience professional failure that is televised live on TV. We all have the opportunity to fail and come back from it. Um, and that's why we have to be willing to take a chance because if we fail, we can come back from it. As Teddy Roosevelt said, the credit belongs to those who are actually in the arena, who strive valiantly, who know the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spend themselves in a worthy cause, who at best know the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if they fail, fail while daring greatly, so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. And that really is fundamentally what's so important that people who are high in emotional intelligence understand if I fail, I can come back. And what I don't wanna do is have regrets about not attempting. Nine, keep stress in perspective. And this is what's so important that often um, we all freak out about the minor um, inconveniences of daily life, being in a traffic jam, having a lot of emails in your inbox, um, very small things. 
But the reality is we can all shift our mindset um, to only think about stress as things that are truly, really very, very important and life-threatening. There's a wonderful book um, written by a neuroscientist at Stanford called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And he calls it that because zebras only show this physiological arousal, this heart beating fast and so on, when they're actually being chased by a lion, when they're actually risking um, you know, life or death. And the challenge is that humans have a tendency to have a, this constant stress arousal with all sorts of things that are kind of minor inconveniences in daily life, um, which are not actually going to be life-threatening. Um, this point was brought home to me a few years ago. I'd given an exam in my intro to psychology class. A student emailed me and said, can I come talk to you? I'm really stressed about my grade in your class. For the record, his grade was a B plus. Um, but so I said, yeah, sure, you know, come in. And we made an appointment. And he comes in. And unfortunately for him, the day that we chose, he chose to come in was the day of the Sandy Hook shootings. And I had spent all morning on my computer hoping that the news reports were wrong, that there was actually a group of kids who were really well hidden, or they just hadn't released that these kids were okay and they hadn't told the media yet. And of course, gradually it became very clear that these kids were not gonna be okay. So the student walks in and says, I'm really stressed about my B plus in your class. And I said, are you aware that there are a bunch of first graders who are dead in an elementary school in Connecticut? And he said, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think I heard something about that, but about my B plus. And I said, you need to let it go. Your B plus really doesn't matter. You're gonna have a fine life and this is not gonna be anything to remember. Um, and the kid kind of looked puzzled, but he walked out of my office and he didn't hate me. I later became his advisor and so on. But that story just really struck with me because we all have the equivalent of what is this B plus? You know, whether that's, you know, losing a big account, whether having a personnel, a, you know, failure in our personal lives, um, our professional lives, um, in which we really, you know, saw it as sort of life or death and major stress, but we all have the ability um, to try to calm ourselves down and to not overreact to things that are not truly life or death. So keeping stress in perspective at a personal level, a professional level, is something that people who are high in EQ are really good at doing. And then finally, um, and this is my last point, and then I'll turn it over to questions. Um, we need to recognize the value of, of adversity in teaching resilience. Um, many colleges and universities send first year students on like an outward bound, you know, hiking canoe trip. And they do that because the research shows that going on one of these experiences um, actually builds resilience, that gives kids a sense later um, when they experience struggles in college, a disappointing midterm grade or breakup of a romantic relationship, they understand that there's in fact some benefit from having been through that experience, they gain skills and resilience. Um, and I want to um, give you one final story, which is a, a true story that happened at Princeton University. I know someone just signed in. Um, and it's about a young man who's pictured in that um, uh, slide that I just posted. And when he was 19 years old, he was heading, um, he was a sophomore Princeton, he was heading home drunk at 3 a.m. He climbed onto a little train on the edge of the Princeton campus, grabbed the two electric wires um, above him, and was severely electrocuted. He lived, but as you can see in this picture, um, he lost both of his legs and one of his arms in this horrific accident. He underwent extensive um, physical therapy, plastic surgery, and so on, um, and eventually returned to Princeton and became pre-med. Then he applied to medical school and graduated from medical school. And today he's a doctor living and working in San Francisco. And a few years ago, he was interviewed by the Princeton Alumni Magazine, and the reporter asked him the question that I imagine all of us would ask him if we had the opportunity to meet him. And here's the question. If you could go back in time and undo that night, undo that experience that so drastically changed your body and your life, would you do so? And here's his answer. No. Too much good stuff had come out of it. I was not headed towards a career in medicine before the accident, and I don't think I'd be as good a physician if I hadn't had that experience. He works now with quadriplegics, with paraplegics, with amputees, and what he says is, when I walk into somebody's hospital room, there's an immediate feeling of rapport and connection because they look at me and my body, and they understand that I get what they're going through. So this experience, that accident, lets me be a better physician, and that's a perfect example of mindset, taking a really difficult personal experience and tragedy and being able to find some good in it. And my final quote for you today is from a wonderful book, also would recommend for our pandemic reading, called My Losing Season by Pat Conroy. 
And what it talks about is a basketball team that loses and loses and loses and the lessons that he learned as a player on that team. Sports books are always about winning because winning is far more pleasurable and exhilarating to read about than losing. Winning is wonderful in every aspect, but the deeper, deeper mu darker music of loss resonates on deeper, richer planes. Loss is a fiercer, more uncompromising teacher, cold-hearted but clear-eyed in its understanding that life is more dilemma than game and more trial than free pass. My acquaintance with loss has sustained me during the stormy passages of my life, when the pink slips came through the door, when the checks bounced at the bank, when I told my small children I was leaving their mother, when the despair caught up with me, when the dreams of suicide began feeling like love songs of release. Though I learned some things from the games we won that year, I learned much, much more from loss. And I'm ending with that quote to illustrate something really important, that we all have bad things happen to us, and that's especially true and salient these days. But we all also have a choice about how we frame and think about those experiences. And people who are high in EQ, are very good about framing difficult experiences in a positive way and moving on. And my final um, picture today, I'll give you in a second, um, I'm gonna return to the story I started today with, my son. Struggled mightily in Spanish, had pulled himself up to an A minus at the end of his um, freshman year. Um, Andrew graduated from, from high school, um, and the summer before he was heading into college, he came to me and my husband and said, I am gonna go to college, but before I go, I really want to accomplish a personal goal, which is becoming fluent in Spanish. I want to take a gap year. So Andrew spent a year between high school and college living in Peru, um, herding llamas, taking salsa dancing lessons, living with a, a Peruvian family. He returned fully bilingual and today he's a junior in college majoring in psychology and Spanish. And I use that story to illustrate the power of emotional intelligence that Andrew took an absolute failure 58 in Spanish at the end of his first trimester of high school and turned it into something that has been truly life-changing in terms of his career, his major, his academic interest, and so on. Um, so we all have that ability, no matter what, to be able to turn negatives into a positive. And boy, this pandemic is a good time for us to practice those skills. Um, so thank you all for listening today. I'm super glad to take questions now in the chat room. Um, anybody who wants a copy of my slide deck, that's my email address. Um, I will answer questions now in the chat room, but if we run out of time or you have to run, it's also totally fine to ask me a question privately. I know sometimes people want to do that. Um, you can watch a, a video of some of my talks on my website. Um, I'm on Instagram talking about um, emotional intelligence and happiness and so on. And anyone who's crazy excited to learn more about it, um, my book is available um, everywhere, The Positive Shift, um, that examines lots of this research um, on mindset and how it um, extends to happiness, health, and longevity. So Thank you so much, Kathy, um, for this invitation to talk. And I'm jealous of you um, being in a part of New Jersey that is so near and dear to my own heart. And thank you all um, so much for listening. And I'm glad to take questions um, if anyone has stuff they want to talk about. Thanks. Yes, please. Please list your questions, please. As you all can tell, this topic is um, very near to and dear to my own heart. I was so happy when Kathy gave me the opportunity um, to share with you all. My other big activity for today is grading student papers. So um, I can't tell you how much more I like talking about emotional intelligence than grading student papers. I gotta be totally <laughs> honest. <laughs> Um, so, um, a question just now, um, how can we reduce the periodic stress um, similar to the zebra? So here's one of the really important things. Humans have a tendency to overwhelmingly think about stress, um, number one, as being life-threatening in lots of ways in which it is really not, um, and to overreact. So we all need to learn techniques, and those are both behavioral and, and cognitive. So one set of things is actually learning ways to reduce your stress. For some people, that's meditation. For other people, it's um, progressive muscle relaxation, so really trying to take deep breaths and to focus on positive thinking. Um, but it also can include reframing things. So um, when something bad happens, our kid has a 58 in Spanish, 
um, we lose a client, um, we're experiencing a professional setback in some way, being able to kind of step back and say, you know what, um, let's try to take this um, with a grain of salt. Um, I, I literally am supposed to be in London right now on a book tour for my new book and I was super excited about doing. And instead, of course, I'm sitting at home in Massachusetts, writing student papers, um, doing laundry, unloading the dishwasher constantly and so on. Um, but the reality is I'm really lucky. Uh, you know, I'm really lucky that I'm not um, experiencing um, a, a health crisis right now, as so many people are. Um, I'm really lucky that my family is safe. Um, and this is really an opportunity for us all to sort of take what we're experiencing and try to find what's good in it instead of what's bad in it. And I think for many people right now, um, this is a really, really hard time, but it also can give us practice in, in dealing with adverse events and trying to be resilient in that. So that's really important. Um, EQ does not, th this next question, um, EQ does not respond to um, a certain Myers-Briggs type. Um, so EQ seems to be a different kind of set of skills. They're both things that psychologists would describe as individual difference measures. Um, but but Myers-Briggs is a, is a type of personality trait, much like you might think about extroversion or optimism or so on. And EQ seems to be a different set of skills um, that crosses. There certainly may be people that have um, more natural abilities within certain of the components of EQ, uh, but even understanding what Myers-Briggs is and your personality trait is actually part of sort of having self-awareness. But EQ can cut across all different kinds of personality traits. Um, uh, another question that I skipped over, sorry about that. How can you speak to adult children to learn life is not perfect and stop negative thoughts? So I got to be honest, I am not naturally a positive person. People often find that odd because I've written this book and I talk about this, but I'm like actually somebody who tends to be um, pretty negative. I, I tend to ruminate about things. I tend to be depressed. Um, I have a family history of bipolar disorder. Um, so I think I kind of come by some of my um, negative thinking naturally. And here's the thing. What we all can do for ourselves, for our adult children, you know, for our spouses and so on, is we actually need to practice. And when I talk about EQ and positive thinking, here's how I talk about it. Um, there are people in the world, my brother is actually one of these people, who can eat whatever they want and they never gain any weight. Um, they just have a naturally like really, really fast metabolism. So that is also not me. Um, but what I've learned is I need to make healthy choices about food, I need to keep exercising and so on so that I can have a healthy lifestyle. Um, and that's exactly the same thing in terms of mental thinking. That for some of us, for, for natural optimists, um, it's actually very easy to do this. You know, when I talk about this, they're like, yeah, well, why wouldn't I see the positive? Why wouldn't I be optimistic? So if you're one of those people, you do this naturally and, and it's easy for you to find the silver lining. But here's the key that we all actually can get better at focusing on the positive. Just for some of us, if it's not our natural tendency, um, we need to practice. We need to develop skills and strategies in doing so. Um, and it takes more effort. But is it possible? Absolutely. It's absolutely possible to do so. Um, I think, I, I think I've, I've responded to all the questions, um, but, I'm, but I'm glad to respond to more. If there are more, um, Kathy, I don't know how we are on time. Um, and I'm, I'm also glad for people to contact me individually if um, you had a question that you didn't want to ask or, or we ran out of time for as well. Uh, we are out of time right now. It's two o'clock now, uh, okay. Eastern time for those on the uh, Eastern side of the, the States. Um, so we are out of time, but if anybody has any questions, you can always email them to me at ISM New Jersey and I'll make sure that Catherine gets them, gets the questions and responds to you. And of course, as we said before, we will send you a copy of the uh, PowerPoint slides and a copy of the recording. And um, everybody that was on this call today also qualifies for one continuing education hour as well. And we do uh, try to keep that up because we know during these times, it's hard for anybody, we can't get out anymore going to in-person meetings and so forth. And we'd like to keep our education content up and our certifications current. So we do thank you for uh, attending today. And um, it looks like everybody really, uh, I see so many positive comments coming in about the presentation today, Catherine. And I, you know, I cannot thank you enough. This was such a timely topic, topic for us today. Good. Well, again, I, I, I hope everyone can get something they can use. We all, as, as individuals, are better off if there's more emotional intelligence in the world. Um, and so thank you, Kathy, for this opportunity to share. Um, and be safe, everyone. Be safe. 
Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day and be safe out there and we'll see you on our next program. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.